Okay, the recording's going. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. So what we're going to go over today is we're just going to just talk briefly um, about why there are gap reports. Uh, we're going to go into the areas of the inventory software uh, that affects gap reports. Um, and so um, enabling, disabling flag, the capitalization criteria, and then those fields in the inventory program that have to do with uh, gap reporting. And then um, we're going to discuss the gap reports. And I'm going to kind of do like a condensed version of what I covered um, the inventory overview that was done earlier this year, um, and just really hone in on you know what you're seeing on those reports. Even though you may be seeing things differently um, on each of them, they all balance, or they all should balance to one another. Um, so we're going to talk about that and talk about balancing the original cost figures on those reports, and also balancing the depreciation figures. Which part of that is using the book value, even though that isn't a gap report. I'm using that to help balance uh, the schedule change and depreciation. So that's what we're gonna cover today. Okay, so um, so while I'm I'm on this one here, um, let me page down here for a sec. Oh yeah, so let me talk about just a little uh, background on just the gap reports in general. And um, I mean, basically what are these for? Um, they're, to help the um, school district with their annual financial um, reporting in accordance, their capital assets information accordance with the general accepted accounting principles, uh, which is GAAP. Um, and so um, I think the biggest change that happened with GAAP is when GASB, um, which is the board um, that manages GAAP, uh, issued the statement 34, which was back in early 2000, um, it's been a while. And uh, because of those changes, um, it brought about a lot of different ways that um, school districts had to conform to those changes in our classic EIS software. Um, just some examples is um, they weren't required, uh, they didn't need to have salvage values anymore was one change. They had to um, define if a building had multiple functionalities. Um, they had to go and split those off into different tags by that function code, by that purpose. Um, so those are just two off the top of my head um, that um, they had to do. So um, a lot of changes took place during that time. Also, um, there are a couple other ones that took place recently, not um, as involved as uh, 34. Um, I think 87 came out. If a few years ago about uh, leasing assets. And so they had a stipulation there. Um, and then also GASB 96 uh, was effective last year. That was subscription-based information technology arrangements. So um, again, just a way for them to um, put that information, you know, include that information correctly um, in, you know, as to where they're um, storing that information and tracking that information, whether it's in our inventory system or whatever they're using. Um, so all of that information about all of these policies, you know, I did some digging and there's some good information out there. There is a state of Ohio capital asset policy that has a lot of information about capital asset reporting for um, entities such as school districts. And I did link that the last um, uh, slide um, on this uh, PowerPoint. And just to uh, back up for a sec here, I did add a PowerPoint to our, let me go show you, to our training and registration page. If you go down there for today's session, um, there is some supporting materials. So that's kind of what I'm going off today is just showing this information to you so that if you want to use this then to share it uh, with your you know, districts, you can. Um, but yeah, there's a link there at the end of this PowerPoint that talks about those capital asset policies. Um, also from the Ohio um, Administrative Code, 
there is, it just basically states that each district should implement a detailed capital asset policy. Um, and they include in, in uh, the um, OAC um, just some recommendations on how to implement that. And I do have an example here of like a capital S asset policy here. And so um, this kind of just shows you what a district, um, you know, could write up for their uh, board policy on their capital assets and how they're tracking and storing them. Um, so this one seems pretty um, specific or pretty um, general on uh, what, you know, they are reporting for their capital assets and how they're classified, which you know, down here is, you know, basically our classification that we have in the inventory system. Um, here they define um, those that, you know, have a useful life of five years and initial cost exceeding 5,000. So that's telling me that that was their policy for the capitalization criteria um, on what is considered a capital asset. And they say that they use the straight line method to determine uh, the depreciation. Um, and they discuss uh, leased assets and also those that um, are donated or capital assets that don't have any um, uh, or that are recorded at their historical cost. So it just talks about, you know, those values in there and what they're doing, as well as, you know, if they're tracking assets that aren't considered capitalized and how they're doing that. So that's all kind of listed in here. So here's the one where they say, you know, control assets is what those assets are called, where they're not capitalized, but they have a value less than the capitalization threshold, um, but they're still tracking them and they can in our inventory application for loss or, you know, for insurance purposes. So this just is just kind of a generic one. Um, I can add this to um, the uh, end of the slideshow as well. I didn't do that, but I can do that as well, just so you can see, um, you know, an example of what a district um, kind of uses for their capital asset policy. So that kind of goes hand in hand, you know, what we're going to talk about today when it comes to gap reporting, because you're talking about capital assets, your capitalized assets. Um, so, so I just kind of wanted to show an example of that. Um, and because of that, you know, unique, unique nature of how this information gets reported, um, you know, with GAP, there is a distinction that must be made between um, the general capital assets and capital assets of proprietary and fiduciary funds. So when you think about that, like I've seen those three, where are those at? That's how all of our GAP reports are sorted by default, by the general proprietary and fiduciary, or general meaning governmental proprietary and fiduciary. Um, and so, you know, that's the reason why those are split out the way they are for the gap reporting. Um, so if you ever wondered, why are those split out that way? That's why they need to be uh, for gap reporting. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to give you a little bit of background on that and why there they are there, you know, and why they're in the format that they're in. Um, so what we're gonna do is take that to the next level and just talk about, you know, the fields and in inventory that affect those gap reports and just talk about the gap reports themselves. So the next thing um, I wanna go into is like the structure and the, like I said, fields involved. So, uh, First off, the gap flag must be enab enabled. So I'm going to go in and show you that here. I'm just kind of go back and forth between this and um, my instance I have set up here. So the enable. Okay, thanks. Yes, I will. I'll do that, Vicki, just so everyone has an example of a policy. Um, so underneath core um, and underneath configuration, is where that gap enabled gap flag is at. So when your districts migrated from EIS and they had their EIS gap flag checked, that would have carried over in the migration. And so their inventory instance would have been enabled by default. And so this one obviously is enabled by default. Um, if I wanted to turn off gap 
um, reporting, I would click on here to disable the gap flag. But because it's enabled here, um, and it's also down here, also confirms that the gap flag is enabled. So what that means basically is first off, um, they have the availability here um, to run any of the gap reports. If that was turned off, uh, they wouldn't have access to these. And also in the background, it's looking at, you know, those specific fields um, that are part of the gap reporting, such as original costs. Because it's gap enabled, you can't just go in and, and change an original cost on an item. Um, so it locks down and secures some of those fields that are re are for gap reporting. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind is, you know, this gap flag in here. So if you have a district that um, didn't migrate over and they're planning on moving into inventory or you helped a non-migrating district, one of the steps in our non-migration procedures is to make sure that that gap flag is enabled. Um, so that's all listed in our migration procedures, but that's kind of where it starts. Another really important part um, of you know, the whole gap reporting and making sure the information is correctly listed on the gap reports is to make sure the cap criteria is set. So, um, and this again is by board policy. That was one of the things I showed you in that board policy is that this district has decided that their capitalization threshold is $5,000 and five years. So that's a, you know, that's one thing that we always like to point out because I know we get tickets from people saying, you know, I put in a bunch of items that are over my threshold. They're not showing on my gap reports. They're not showing as capitalized when I look at them. Well, I think the biggest factor is the life limit. If you put in an asset and let's say it was $10,000, but let's say you didn't fill in the depreciation information, specifically the useful life was missed, was skipped. Um, it will not be capitalized. So it has to meet both of these criteria in order for it to be a capitalized asset. So, you know, if you have a district that said, you know, I put these in, they're over the $5,000 limit. My first question would be is, when you created those items, did you add a useful life? Um, and if they didn't, then the item's still gonna show as non-cap. So until they add that useful life to the asset, um, then it will show up as capitalized and those figures then, their original costs um, and depreciation figures will show up on the gap reports. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's not and, or it's not or, it's and. It has to meet both of these. Um, I know some districts use both. Some districts just have um, the capitalization threshold, the amount, and that's it. They don't do a life limit. Um, again, that's board policy. Um, so whatever they, you know, have, have planned, um, you know, they want to put that stuff in here. So obviously, like I said, if it came from migration, this information will already be in here. Otherwise, non-migrated districts, this needs to be set up to what their uh, policy dictates. Um, and then if they do need to go in and change, let's say they made a, a policy um, adjustment and they need to go in and change the threshold, this is where um, they would go in to make those changes. Um, and they can go in and um, enter in, you know, whatever it is, let's say they're going to drop the life limit and it's just going to be 5,000. Well, um, they may have a lot more items um, that are now going to be capitalized because of that. And that will affect um, the gap reports. If they do this in the middle of the year, those items that weren't um, uh, capitalized, now they are, um, those are going to increase some of those values on the gap report. So, and we'll get into that when we talk about, especially the change schedules. Um, and we'll talk about that more and how that gets impacted and where on the report that shows up. So they can do a projection in here as well. Um, and what this will do basically is when they, you know, change their capitalization criteria, it's going to tell them these are the tags that are going to be affected. Um, so it's nice to, to look at that projection report sure, first, just to make sure everything looks okay before they run the actual. So that's um, uh, like two of the big biggest things, right, is making sure the gap flags enabled and making sure the cap criteria is set according to board policy. And so what I'm going to get into next are those fields that affect, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here, make sure I didn't miss anything. 
Um, I don't want to get into that yet. I want to talk about this first. And these are the fields that are used with gap reporting. Um, and so I'll kind of go into a few of these here, but this is just kind of a table to show you. Obviously, the fund and the fund type are huge. Um, those are going to, um, you know, your fund types, um, governmental, proprietary, fiduciary, that's how the reports are broken out into those three fund types. So, you know, a fund, an item um, that's capitalized should have a fund code and that fund code should have a fund type. Now those are stored back underneath the funds here. And so in here in my sample file, so I know some of this might not look the best, but um, uh, what this is, is that all the fund codes that are used in inventory. So when I go and add an item and it prompts me for a fund, um, and when I mean adding the item, I'm not talking about the fund code on the account code on the acquisition, I'm talking about the items screen, the item window, where it's prompting you for a fund, a function, and an asset class. Um, this is the fund. This is where it's pulling from. It's from these list of funds. So each of these funds should have a fund type listed. So if for some reason, um, and I, you know, it's usually um, a migration issue where something classic let a lot of things empty. Um, and so because of that, um, it may have migrated over that way. And so if you do have a particular fund that doesn't have a fund type, um, that will be affected on the gap report. So usually if this is blank, it's an unknown fund, right? Because a unknown fund type because 007, for example, is blank on core funds. So you're going to see any items, capitalized items that are related to the 007 fund probably show up on the fixed assets by source uh, report underneath unknown funds because it can't distinguish the type. So it's just going to stick it in that area of the report. So those are the things we're going to get into a little bit later. But you know, the, the fund and the fund type are very important parts. Um, so I'm gonna flip back. Also uh, the function, um, this defines where that asset's currently being used. So like I said, when you create that item, it asks you for the fund, a function and an asset class. So I'm just gonna touch upon these two, the function and asset classes. And again, these are stored underneath core. So it's looking at what we have in here to determine, um, so if I go in here and add, you know, 02 or 0200, and I try to add an asset class um, with 0200, when I add an item, it's not going to recognize it because it's not stored in my asset class grid. So these are, you know, the general ones that uh, most districts um, use. They could have it labeled, it takes up to four characters. So they could have 0100, or they could just have 01. It means at least two characters to define it properly. So that's why you're seeing some of this, this 01LD that probably came about still under the land asset class. This probably came about from those GASB 34 changes that took place where they had to go in and specify some of these land improvements uh, separately. Um, and so, or maybe the 01 is the land improvements from what it looks like here. Um, so they had to go in and that was part of the, the 34 policy was to go in and split those, those land improvements out maybe into a, a separate asset class. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, these are important as well as the function codes here. So the function codes here is where is this asset being used? So I know some districts use the same function codes that they use in USAS, uh, which makes perfect sense. And others may not break it down as much and maybe just do like 1100, um, 1200, 1300 in inventory. So it's totally up to the district and their policy and what they want to do. Um, but you can see that the function is just basically the code and the definition, just like the asset class. Okay. Back. 
Um, the status. So the status plays a, a really important part um, in the GAP reports. Um, when uh, we say active status with the GAP reports, what we really mean are those items that are either active, new, excess asset not in use, or excess asset held for sale. Those are all considered active uh, in GAP. Um, so, you know, you're going to see those active ones getting pulled in to the um, GAP reports, um, the fixed asset by source, uh, the schedule change that uh, reports, the uh, uh, function class reports. So those active ones are the ones that are going to get pulled into those. Um, the schedule of change does show disposition as well. Um, or disposed of assets. Um, there's a disposed of column. So I don't wanna say they all just show active. The schedule of change reports do include those that have been disposed of as well. And again, we'll get into that report here in a little bit. Um, the original cost, it could be this, the historical cost of the item or obviously the purchased um, amount. Um, the acquisition method. Um, this is important too, because on some of these reports, like the fixed asset by source report, um, they break those out into separate areas, donated versus leased versus other. Um, so it's important uh, that those are defined correctly when the item is being created. And then the lease type, if there are items that um, are lease type of items, is it a capital lease? You want it that lease to show up on the gap reports? or is it an operating uh, lease? Operating leases are not included on the gap reports. Um, depreciation information, it's huge. You know, if you're depreciating a capitalized asset, you want to make sure that all the depreciation fields are filled in properly. And I think I have a couple slides at the end um, that we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail. Um, acquisition information, very important, you know, do you what, you enter in when you first create an item, the first place it takes you to is the acquisition screen. And this is um, the purchase information, the PO, the account code that was used. Um, those are play a very important role, especially in the fixed asset by source report, because that is the source where it's coming from. That's the acquisition information. So that fixed asset by source gap report is really important part when you're talking about um, the acquisition information of an item. And then obviously the disposition information, when you dispose of a capitalized asset, it's going to show up on the schedule of change in fixed assets and the schedule of change in depreciation reports. Um, so um, very important that all of those get uh, recorded correctly. And obviously transfer transactions. For those of you that are really new to inventory and you're like, what's a transfer transaction? Well, let's say the item was created last year um, and it was created. And what, when the item was created, the wrong asset class was assigned to it. So maybe it was um, an 0300 by mistake and it really should have been an 0400. It should have been some type of vehicle type of purchase. Um, so you can't just go into the item and modify the asset class. Um, that's kind of one of those restrictions we have on the system, especially for gap reporting. Instead, you would create a transfer transaction. And when you do that, you can say, I want to switch this from the 0300 asset class to the 0400. And so when you do that, then for those capitalized assets, it's going to show up on the gap report as well, just like a disposition posting would. Um, and it's going to show two columns on the change schedule reports showing where it was transferred out of the 0300 and where it was transferred into the 0400. So basically, you know, on the report, it's a wash because in and out results to zero. Um, but it's necessary to see that information and it's basically telling them why. Um, and, you know, with the gap reports, you know, for those of you that are familiar with them, um, it's uh, nice because those gap reports have a summary report and a detail report. That detail report is so helpful. I love the summary report because it shows you this is the beginning. These are the changes that I made through the year. And this is the ending balance. Got it. But those in-between columns on that summary report, 
the acquisitions, the dispositions, what makes up those figures? That's where the detail report gives you that answer. It tells you the tags that make up those amounts. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important that both reports are run and part of the fiscal year and bundle of, at the end of the year so they, the auditors can see that information. Okay, so I'm gonna go back, go back to my page up, if there's anything else in here. Um, you know, and I, I did state active items um, will be included on the first uh, two gap reports. But when it comes to the change schedules, obviously um, disposed of assets are going to appear on there as well. Uh, we need to get a running, you know, account of what happened during the year. So there is a disposition column on those. We talked about the leased ones and also including and excluding entity IDs. So this is um, kind of uh, where districts, if they have like a lot of something, like a lot of chairs or tables or computers or something like that, laptops, where they, if they split them out, um, they will show as under the threshold amount, right? But if they have them all grouped under one tag, that could be over the threshold amount. Um, and if the district does not want those to show as capitalized, because if they break them out, they wouldn't be, there is an option in the item where they could add uh, an field or add a whatever they want on the entity ID. They could label it no gap, exclude, whatever they want it to be, but it would be underneath the entity ID field. I can show you where that's at, but items. And it's underneath the actual item. Uh, there it is, entity ID. So, and they, they could put it's numeric or alphanumeric. They could put whatever they want here, um, but it will show here, um, you know, that if they have a lot where let's say the number is 50, you know, or something like that, 50 chairs. Well, 50 chairs is probably going to definitely take me over my threshold, right? But if I split out those 50 chairs, each chair is not going to be considered capitalized. Um, so, but if I don't want to go into the process of splitting those out, um, I can leave them as a lot and leave them with the 50, put an entity ID of no gap or exclude. Um, and then what happens then when I run the gap reports, I can exclude certain entity IDs from that report. So when I uh, run the fixed asset by source, there's a prompt in there, do you want to exclude an entity ID? And I can put in no gap. And then this tag, the amounts of this tag will not be included in my report. So that's what that's all about. Now I do know that there is uh, um, a new gap requirement for fiscal year 24 that um, requires uh, to record individual items as a group. Um, and so, you know, that would, you know, kind of take care of this, um, what I just explained. But I think um, the problem that uh, users are having is they, you know, some of them did split it out and now they kind of want to regroup those back together. Um, and so these are things that I think we're kind of um, finalizing on that, I know that um, there was, I think, a ticket on that not too long ago, like within the last week. And once we get kind of more of a confirmation on that and what we need to do, we'll post that um, probably in our FAQs in inventory and just talk about this new gap requirement. Um, basically taking those broken out and regrouping them into one tag. We don't have a way to do that in the software. But um, I know that they have discussed this with the Otter State's office um, about what needs to be done. And I think we, we have gotten confirmation from them, but we just need to update it in um, the manual. So uh, we'll let you know, um, or that will get posted in the FAQs once we get that information. Let's see here. Hey, okay. go back to my PowerPoint here. So any questions about like those assets or those items that 
are part of the gap um, schedules. Before I go in here to the next slide, I just want to recap those. So again, if I go in and just look at one of these tags, um, first off, it'll tell me right away if it's capitalized or not. So if this was checked, um, then the amount of this item would be included in the gap schedules. If it's an active item. Um, and like I said, um, what it's looking for here, obviously, entity ID, if we're um, going to purposely exclude entity IDs, here is the fund, the function, and the asset class. These are used. Obviously, the original cost is used. The status is used. Um, the acquisition information. When was it acquired? How was it acquired? Purchase, lease. Um, the beginning amount, you'll notice here that this is a very important part because this defines the beginning balances um, for those change schedule reports. So, um, so this, you know, this is an, an item that cannot just be modified. Um, when an item is recorded and added that year, um, the original cost obviously will be reflected. Once, and if this is a, you know, it does it for capitalized and non-capitalized, obviously. But once that year is closed, that beginning balance gets cemented, saying for those capitalized assets, especially, you know, it's going to say, this was my beginning balance um, for the next fiscal year. This is now included because it's now a capitalized asset. So it's going to be included in that beginning balance on those change schedule reports. Um, here is the uh, depreciation information. So if I am tracking depreciation for these items, I need to define the method. Um, and so I believe most everyone uses straight line um, and a beginning date. Um, that's very important when it comes to, um, you know, making sure that you're tracking depreciation correctly. Um, and I believe um, now it's to the point where um, it is... Uh, um, I think by default it's required. So um, you need to have in a beginning date. Here's the life, very important, um, especially if their capitalization criteria requires both a threshold amount and a life limit, um, and then the life to date depreciation. So those are all the fields that play in to your gap reports. All right. Go ahead and close out of this and go back to my PowerPoint here. So um, what we're going to talk about now, and I'm not sure if I'm going to run the reports per se. I think that these screenshots, try to make this bigger, um, I do a better job of explaining these reports. And basically, running the reports um, is pretty simple. Um, there's not a whole lot to it when you actually run the report. Now, what is on the report? There's a lot of information here. And so just to go back real quick, our gap reports are underneath the reports option. And these are the four reports. And we're going to do them. Um, I know they're listed alphabetically, but we're going to do them in this way. We're going to talk about the fixed asset by source first, and then the fixed asset by function class. And then the schedule of change, when I keep talking about change schedules, these are the two reports I'm referring to. to. The schedule of change in fixed assets, which is the original cost, and the schedule of change in depreciation, which is the depreciation information. So that's how we're going to go in order here when I go through these PowerPoint slides. Okay. And so um, this first one is the fixed asset by source. So um, this by source means that this is uh, the acquisi acquisition method and the account code used when that fund was purchased. So even though it's showing all the original cost amounts here, it's actually sorting it by where was this used? Where was this purchased from? What account? Um, and again, like I said, all of our uh, GAP reports are gonna break them down by the fund types, fiduciary, governmental, propri proprietary. So this report starts off with fiduciary. 
And you'll see here that it's listing, you know, all the information um, regarding that. So governmental is probably the busiest um, area of this report because most of your fund codes with the fund type, most of them are probably governmental. So that's probably where you're going to see most of the activity is on there. So just going back here, again, this contains a summary of the original costs of your capitalized assets. And the source means it uses the acquisition method and account codes fund. So when you think when you create an item and you first takes you, it first takes you to the acquisition window, there's an area where you can enter in the account code. It isn't required, but you can enter in the account code that the item was purchased from. So um, that's where this then pulls that information in. And purchased items are listed by the source fund code from which the item was purchased from. And then the acquisition methods of donated, leased, and other have their own lines. So looking at this, everything above capital leases, donations, and others, those are the other acquisition types. The purchased ones are all listed here. So just split out by the source fund they were purchased from. So that makes sense. So here's just an example. When I keep saying by the, the source fund, when you create the acquisition portion of the item um, and you enter an account code, this is what I'm talking about. The 501 was the fund. It's going to show up in the 501 area of the report with whatever items um, that have a source um, fund code, a 501, those are all going to get tallied up and it's going to display the total over here. So I want to go in a little bit further about how this even gets created because this these aren't the standard um, codes. Every district's schedule of fixed asset by source is going to look different. Um, and so I just want to explain how and why. And so I know, don't be scared here. <laughs> um, I kind of like took some of that, basically took that report and enlarged it and explained where this information is coming from, okay? So um, basically I'm still on that same report, but I'm looking at, um, you know, the different fun type areas here. And so um, basically up top here, um, I'm kind of explaining where this information is coming from. So if you have an item that has um, the source information is related to um, a fund underneath that is tied to a fidu fiduciary fund type, that information is going to show here. Well, we don't have any purchase information um, or else the information would show up here. All that it shows is the capital donation and other and acquisitions to prior to system startup. You're going to see these four fields, every fund type, okay? So those are definitely going to be listed, but they may, they must not have any um, items that were purchased with a fund tied to the fiduciary fund type or else that information would show here. Now they do have an amount under acquisition prior to system startup, and so um, we do have some information in the fixed asset by source manual that explains where that's coming from. And I do have like just a little blurb here explaining it, but there's more information in the chapter. So if an item's acquisition source fund, so that fund number on the account code is blank or zeros, it will reference the item's asset fund so and then it's looking at its fund type and it's going to include the acquisition amount in the fund type section of the report under the acquisitions prior to system startup so this is basically telling me that one there may not be an acquisition record for that item for some reason maybe it migrated over that way from classic or the fund type is empty, or I'm sorry, the fund 
portion of the account code is empty. And so um, it doesn't know where to put it. So it's going to place it in that acquisition prior to system startup. Now that can be remedied by going in and following the how to fix areas in the chapter. And it will explain how you can find the acquisition prior to system startup figures and how you can fix them so they go into the right areas of the fixed asset by source. Uh, to be honest, it's been like this forever. Um, and I'm assuming that the auditors are okay with this information uh, because it was like this in classic as well. They had a, you know, an area, I mean, you can see this one down here, 25 million in acquisitions prior to system startup. Where, what tags are tied to those? You know, we have a way to find those in the system, but they've, you know, obviously districts haven't, um, some of districts haven't changed that information and just left them in there. And it's like I said, usually because there wasn't an acquisition tied to it or that acquisition record, the fund or that account code is missing or blank. Okay, this next one here, um, so, you know, you've got this acquisition prior to system startup and also, like I said, type of fiduciary type items that may be capital with an acquisition method of capital lease, a donation or other, those will show up in this area. Um, but I'm just going to switch over to like governmental fund type ones. So, like I said, this is the busiest area. And so, again, you're going to see capital donation other and acquisition going to work the same way as it does up like the fiduciary. But I want to talk about these other ones that you're seeing. You're going to see some in here that have the name of the fund um, with the actual number. And then you're going to see some that just have a number. And it's like, what's the difference between these two? So... When you see one that has the name and the actual fund code here, what that means is if the item's acquisition contains a fund dimension on the account code and that fund is listed underneath cord funds, it will include the acquisition amount, quote, the original cost, under the asset fund code under its associated fund type. So uh, using you know, permanent improvement, for example, if I have items that when I created the item and I plugged in the account code that I purchased it from and the fund number was 003, and then I added the item and my fund underneath there was 003, and that is noted also the 00Z, fund is noted underneath core funds, it's going to label it on this report this way. Now, for those that just say 499, so like, for example, this one says 499 and doesn't have a description before it, what that means is if the acquisition contains a fund dimension on the account code, but the fund dimension is not listed in core funds. Up here it was, up here it isn't. It will include the acquisition amount under the fund dimension displayed in parentheses under the associated items asset fund fund type. So again, this one, it doesn't know, it, it, it has a fund and it has a fund um, in um, the item but it's not listed underneath core funds. It doesn't know, you know, where to exactly put it because it's not an actual core fund code. It's going to use the acquisition code and place it in here. So that's the difference between the two. And again, this is all I have better screenshots of each of these details in the fixed asset by source chapter. Um, but this kind of gives you just maybe a little summary of each of these, you know, where is acquisition prior to system startup coming from? Why are these displayed this way? But why are these displayed this way? Um, and also, you know, so it's going to look like this for each of these types, fiduciary, governmental, proprietary. One other thing, 
is um, you may have a fun type called unknown. And you're like, where's this coming from? I thought there were only three. Well, there could be another one. And that is if the acquisition source fund dimension of the account code is blank and the items fund code is blank as well, it will include the amount on the acquisition prior to system startup underneath the unknown fund type. It, if there's no fund on the item, the actual you know, item fund, asset fund on the item, it doesn't know where to put it because it's not, it's not listed. And if it's not listed, it doesn't have a fund type tied to it. So the fund type is unknown. It's going to pull it in here. So obviously this district, they're good to go. They don't have any unknown fund types. So if I went and looked at core funds, um, for one, all of my funds have a fund type. There isn't one that's empty or missing. That's good. And also if I go in and look at my items, um, all my items have a, a fund code. Um, so again, you know, those are the type of things that you want to look at as to why things aren't showing. Um, this, you know, slide kind of explains those four major things that you might see um, or that your districts may have questions about or the auditors. And then, like I said, the fixed asset by source chapter really goes into details and has screenshots of all of this and explains it even more detail. So that's where I would take them to look at the chapter, you know, get the information there. So lots of stuff going on, but this is this fixed asset by source is, you know, showing where it was acquired from, what account code was it purchased from. So, and you know, it looks at that um, more than looking at, you know, the fund that it was currently used for. So, um, so that's what that report's all about. Um, the next slide I want to talk about is the next gap report, and that's the fixed asset by function and class. Um, and all this does is it generates a schedule of fixed assets by either function, class, or both. So it's just another way of running the gap report um, and listing out, like I said, by function or class. So um, same information as what you see on the fixed asset. It's the original cost. But this has a separate column too. It does track the book value. And the book value is the original cost minus the total depreciation. Total depreciation is life to date and the current year to date depreciation. Um, so those two columns are what you're gonna see on that report. Um, and so this just kind of goes over those three, but I have a screenshot here, hopefully the next one that explains it just a little bit more here. Go up just a little. Okay. So what I did is because you can run the report three different ways, by function and class is one option, by just class, and then a summary by function and class. I wanted to kind of show those three. And then I also wanted to talk about a couple of areas in the report that mm, you may not sh know where those are coming from. Um, and so by function and class is pretty self-explanatory here. It's showing the amounts by the function and then by there, breaking them out by each asset class under that function code. And it's gonna show you the original cost and then the book value. So here, you know, is where that depreciation does come into play. So, you know, the depreciation is on the schedule um, of fixed assets report, and it's also on the schedule of change in depreciation and on the book value. So you could balance those three ports reports together. And I'll show you that here near the end. Um, so this is like the first report. And, you know, I think most auditors request all three different runs. Um, so I think all three different runs are included in our fiscal year end report bundle. Um, the schedule of fixed assets by class. This is my favorite one just because it's the easiest to read. Um, it's just breaking it out by class. So if I'm running my schedule of change in fixed assets by class, probably going to run my schedule of fixed assets by class. Um, that way I can compare the two and see that they match. Um, so again, real easy. All it does by each fund type 
is it just sorts them by the class. Um, and again, shows the original cost and the book value. Now, the third report uh, option in there is a summary schedule. And so this one does a, look a little bit different, uh, has like different options in there. You'll notice right away, you don't see like original cost and book value at the same time on the report. You can run this report by original cost or by book value. So one or the other, I chose original cost in here, um, but basically it's just another format. It just looks a little bit different, but it has all the original cost information, but it's summarizing it by the function. And then it shows me and breaks down then each function code by that two digit function. And then it breaks it out though, by the different columns of asset classes here. So just a different way. So this is one way of seeing that information and this is another way of seeing that information. This way shows original cost and book value on the same report. This one you have to select when you generate the report. Do I wanna see original cost values or do I wanna see book value figures? Um, so those are the three different reports. Um, within this report function. Um, and then down over here, I just wanted to talk about where you could see some areas of, of these reports that may be labeled invalid function or it's undetermined. So in here, um, there are items that have a missing function code. And so, you know, when I look at this item, you know, I'm like, or this area of the report, I'm like, okay, invalid function, what tag is this? What is this tied to? Well, the best way to determine that is to go to the asset class 0101. So I go into the items grid and type in the asset class, and I'm going to find an item that has a missing function. And that is the amount right there that makes up the amount on here. So this is an easy fix. I could do a transfer transaction and put in the right function tied to that account, and this will remove it from the invalid function area of the report and put it in the right spot on the report. Um, undetermined is another area that you're gonna find, and you're gonna see invalid and undetermined in the other reports, gap reports as well. But I just thought I would talk about it on this one, but it basically behaves the same way on the other reports. So here's an example um, of undetermined here. So at this point, I'm what I'm doing is I'm going in and it's basically undetermined means it doesn't know what fun type to put it in. What, where, where are we, you know, where is it going? And so it puts it in this undetermined area. And so I could go in and put in, you know, the 1110 function code in here um, and look to see, you know, what, you know, funds uh, pop up with this. And then from there, I can go look up those funds under core funds. And what's probably happened is it doesn't have a fund type listed. Um, and so again, an easy fix, you would go into core funds, edit that fund, add the fund type. And then in here, then um, it will change this and move it to where it should be. So I just have a couple examples of that. In here. But again, this is all explained in more detail with probably better screenshots in the uh, GAP uh, report chapter in the documentation. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, the change schedules. Uh, so um, this is the fixed uh, schedule of change in fixed assets and the schedule of change in depreciation. So we call them change schedules for a reason. It's because we have different columns denoting the changes that were made to those capitalized assets throughout the year. So obviously the uh, schedule of change in fixed assets are your original cost figures. And then the schedule change of depreciation is, is the depreciation amounts. And um, when you're creating these reports, you can sort them by asset class, fund, or function. Um, you know, if I'm balancing, which is what we're going to get to next, if I'm balancing between these reports, 
I try to make it as easy as possible. So if I'm running the schedule of change um, and fixed assets by class, probably ran the other two reports, the fixed assets by source and the uh, schedule of fixed assets reports by class as well. Um, just so, you know, I everything looks the same, right? You know, I've got the different areas. Um, so um, with the schedule of change reports, you have a summary option and you have a detailed option. So if the summary is checked, it's going to create that summary report, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. The detail, if the summary is left unchecked, it won't generate the summary report. Instead, it will create a detailed report, basically showing you the tag numbers that make up those figures in those change schedule columns, acquisitions, dispositions, transfers, in and out, adjustments. Um, it'll show you the tags that make up those amounts. Very important. So they can see where are these amounts coming from. One tip I wanted to tell you that in regards to the schedule of change and depreciation, so if there haven't been any changes yet in the current year, meaning no items added, disposed of, whatever, that are tracking depreciation. Um, if there haven't been any changes made yet in the year, and the district runs a schedule of change and depreciation detail, and they're like, there's no report, that's correct. Um, it will not generate it until there's activity. Um, that's been made. So um, that could be the reason why. And the real easy way to tell is run a schedule change by fixed assets. If the acquisition, disposition, transfer columns are all zeros, that's a good indication that nothing's been done yet activity-wise um, for items for the for the calendar for the fiscal year yet. So your schedule change and depreciation will not generate until you know stuff's been done. So um, this probably only happens like at the beginning of the year. They, you know, they close out the year and they're in the new year and they really haven't done anything yet, but they're just running some reports and they're, you know, and we usually get a ticket. Why doesn't the, the detail report run for my depreciation? That's because you haven't done anything yet. So, uh, so that explains that. So this is where I kind of want to get into some of the things that you're seeing on this report. And this is the summary report of the schedule change in fixed assets. So these are your original cost figures. And so basically, um, again, I'm sorting mine by asset class. And so it's showing a description and it's showing a beginning value. So this is the beginning balance amounts. Remember when you were in the item screen and we saw um, the beginning balance field that's stored, that's locked in there. And what this report then is doing is going out there and pulling those um, those items that are been, that were active as of the beginning of the year that are capitalized. And it's going to total all that up by the um, asset class that they're linked to. And it's going to put that amount here. And so what happens then is these are the change columns that we were talking about. And then we get the ending balance. So these columns here, when you run the detail report, will show you the tags that make up the amounts of these columns. Um, but uh, when you're creating a new capitalized item or you're ent entering additional acquisition information for an existing item, those acquisition amounts are going to show up here under the acquisition column. And so uh, we do have notes here about things that could um, and how they behave. So if I have an existing item that had an additional positive acquisition amount entered during the year, bringing it over the capitalization threshold, so that item was non-cap, right? So it would not have been included in the beginning value. But now I increased the acquisition, the original cost of the item. So now that it is a capitalized asset, what's going to happen is that acquisition amount for this year is going to show up underneath the acquisition column. But the rest of that original cost is going to appear as a positive amount under the adjustment column. 
that part of the item wasn't truly acquired this year. The additional part was, so that'll show here, but the rest of it was done last year. And when it wasn't capitalized yet, it was still under the threshold. Well, then that amount is going to show up underneath the adjustment column. And what that's what's nice, again, about the detail report, because it'll tell you why. Like, where are these coming from? So, um, so that's what's going on there. And then I just have a note here, if it's the opposite, vice versa, if you entered in a negative acquisition amount where the item was capitalized, so it was included in the beginning value of the year, and now you have it so that it no longer is capitalized, now you've changed the capitalization status due to this negative acquisition, then the additional negative acquisition amount will appear in the acquisition column as a negative. And then the rest of the original cost of that item will appear under the adjustment column because it was included in here. You did a negative amount of $500 um, and then the rest of that. So that's going to show here, but then the rest of that amount that's still in here needs to come out. So that will show as a negative adjustment here, basically removing it um, and it will, it will not be part of the ending balance then. Uh, um, disposition amounts, again, these are just um, amounts of items that were part of the beginning balance. Um, so they are in here at the beginning of the year, but then were disposed of during the year. So they have to go somewhere, right? They have to be taken out of here. We do not want to affect the beginning balance. Um, and so, I mean, that's a, you know, a, when the first question the auditors are going to ask is, you know, why is the beginning balance, you know, different than it was in the prior year? And I know we did have one major change this year about how the um, amounts are being reported, the acquisitions versus original costs. We've had a few tickets on those. If you do get questions about it, you know, obviously create a ticket to us. Um, but uh, for the most part, I think we've done enough in the system <laughs> the last few years to make it so those beginning balances never change. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so hopefully after, you know, it's we've been on inventory here for a couple of years now, I think we got this pretty much locked in place now where those figures won't change and we won't have all of those questions um, from auditors about why is there a difference in the ending balance of this year versus the beginning balance of the new year. Um, so yeah, I do have, and I couldn't fit all of the columns on this one slide. So I'm taking the next part and, and putting it on the following here. Um, the transfers in and out, um, obviously, like I used an example earlier where it was the wrong uh, asset class. It was an 0300 when it should have been an 0400. So it was a capitalized asset. Those figures are gonna uh, show up here, transfer out, of the 0300 and transfer into the 0400. So basically it's a wash between the two, but it's recorded uh, to show. And then the adjusted am amount. Like I said, this includes amounts for transactions that may have been changed. Their cap status may have been changed, which we just talked about in the prior slide with those um, acquisition examples. Another reason why there could be an amount on the adjustment is because you created a capitalized asset for the year, really should have been done in a prior year. And when you created it, you marked the error adjustment flag on that item. And because you did that, you really didn't want it to show the true acquisition for the year. You wanted it to be reflected as an adjustment because even though you had to add it this year because you didn't want to reopen uh, last year's, period, you wanted to keep it in this year, um, it forces you to put in an acquisition date when you create the acquisition portion in the current year. But you kind of wanted to know, like, even though I'm adding it this year, it really was acquired last year. So I'm going to check the error adjustment flag so it shows up in my gap schedules under the adjustment column. Um, just another thing, too. Um, running the capitalization criteria, and I kind of briefly mentioned this when we were talking about the cap criteria er earlier, um, that it does affect um, these gap schedules. So if the
the capitalization criteria was decreased and the current threshold um, so, so that an item has now changed from non-cap to capitalized. And you got to think about that. You just said decrease. I decreased the threshold amount, which is now causing some items that were non-cap um, that has now changed their non-cap to a capitalized status. Um, so that entire original cost amount of that item, now that it's a capitalized item, is going to appear as a positive adjustment. It will not mess with the beginning value. We painstakingly try to get that to work here so that this is the number one reason, I think, why uh, some districts, especially in classic, why are my beginning balances different from my ending balances of the prior year? And when they ran um, the EIS CAP program is what it was called in classic, they didn't, a lot of districts didn't save it. So they didn't have proof. And our audit report in classic didn't audit that. So you, you know, couldn't say that it was a capitalization criteria change. Um, but, and so, you know, when we started, you know, working with this and working with the auditors, it's like, why are we changing the beginning values? We should be changing the adjustment amounts, right? So it reflects there instead. So that's where these type of capital criteria, uh, cap criteria changes, whether you're decreasing cap criteria value or you're increasing it, um, any of those items that get affected because they are now capitalized or they're no longer capitalized is going to show up in the adjustments column. And it's going to work that way for original cost and for those items where you're tracking depreciation. It'll show up on the schedule of change in depreciation as well. So just wanted to make note of that so you understood that. That's documented as well in the chapter, but it's just good to know what could what could you know be in here. So that's another one. Um, so just talking about those three reports that we just did, those are all by original cost. I know that uh, the second report, you know, did have the book value information in it as well, but there's also the original cost information. So districts should be balancing the three reports and making sure that the figures match between them. And so they can look, look at the grand total, uh, we never had a grand total on the classic reports, and it's such a, a nice feature to have um, on these. And they can look at the grand total and compare the fixed asset by source, the fixed asset by function class, the original cost column, and the schedule of change in fixed assets ending balance. Those should all match. So this is where we're getting into the balancing portion of this. And so... Here is an example of what I'm talking about here. Zoom out a little bit here. Okay. And so my, I don't know, what I do, what I have here is a screenshot of the fixed asset by source total balances. So this is all of the original cost items on the fixed asset by source. And then I ran the fixed asset by function class, all three port options. And then I went in and ran the summary schedule of change in fixed assets by each of these class, fund, and function. And they should all match. So my total on the fixed asset by source should equal the original cost on these reports. Now, the summary schedule of fixed assets doesn't have a total. I would have to go into each of the uh, categories and add those up. So if I would add them all up, it should amount to the same amount on my other reports here. And then the summary schedule of change in fixed assets, the ending balance should be the same. So those all should match. So that's where they want to go in and make sure that these balance to each other. Okay. And the next thing we're going to get into is um, the schedule change and depreciation. So that's, you know, we got two change schedules, schedule change in fixed assets, which is your original costs, and the schedule change in depreciation. 
So again, I just took a snippet um, of, you know, the different calculations that are going on here. And I want to talk about where these figures are coming from. So that beginning depreciation is the current life-to-date depreciation value. So it's life-to-date depreciation as of June 30th of the last year close. So if I'm in 2024, it's going to show everything up through the end of 2023. And that was active um, and capitalized at the beginning of this current fiscal year. It's going to display it here. Now, continuing is your year-to-date depreciation. So if you want to quick kind of see what's what are these two columns, life-to-date, year-to-date depreciation. Life-to-date depreciation, year-to-date depreciation. This is tracking the depreciation for any existing assets throughout the year um, that haven't been acquired, disposed of, or had transfers in and out or air adjustments. So it's going to have that information in here. So nothing that had any activity right against it is going to show in the continuing items. And then our acquisition, again, you have to remember, this is just depreciation information. So any newly created capitalized items um, or anywhere um, additional um, acquisitions were added that would have changed um, the depreciation is going to show underneath the acquisition portion. And again, I talked about the same notes that I did regarding acquisitions, whether it was a positive or negative acquisition and how that impacts depreciation, just like I talked about how it impacted original cost in the prior slide. So um, that's this note, so I won't go through that again. And then just moving on to the other three areas of this report, the disposition, life to date and fiscal to date depreciation of capitalized assets, transfer in and transfer outs as well. And then the air adjustment, again, works the same way as it did with the original costs. Um, if the air adjustment flag was was um, set on those items and it's tracking depreciation, the depreciation amount's gonna appear in here. Or, you know, if there were changes made to those items, whereas they became capitalized or they're no longer capitalized, the depreciation amounts for those will appear um, under, underneath the air adjustment. Also, the running, the capitalization criteria, um, again, works the same way as what I discussed on the original cost, whether they increased or decreased um, their threshold any items that are tracking depreciation, it's going to affect that information. Um, and it's going to put that information on the adjustment column. It will not touch the beginning depreciation information. OK. So what I really want to get into here is the balancing. So we know that those first three reports balance with each other. Um, but what can we balance the uh, schedule of change and depreciation against. We can uh, balance it against the book value. And so that's where they can go in here um, and run the two reports. Now, we do get uh, tickets saying I ran them and they don't balance. You really have to be careful when you're running the book value um, of, of the options that you're choosing. Um, and so when you run the book value, you want to make sure that capitalized assets only are being included and that active items are being included. So that means active, new item, excess asset for sale and excess asset not in use. Those are considered your active items. <laughs> so I would also just as a tip is sort the book value the same way you sorted your schedule of change and depreciation. I like to sort by asset class so if I sorted my schedule change and depreciation by asset class, I'm going to do the same thing on my book value. Um, I have an option in there to sort it by asset class. That way I can compare each asset class totals and make sure that they match. Um, also, obviously, if those match, then your grand total for all funds on both reports would match as well. Um, and so this next slide, I don't want to scare you again, but this next slide um, kind of explains all of that in um, 
how to compare these reports. And I'm going to scroll up a little bit. So, and I threw in the schedule of fixed assets by class report on this one too. So this is what we're looking at when, so this is what districts would look at and the auditors when they're trying to balance these reports. So here's my schedule of change and depreciation by class. This is my summary report. And it's, I'm at the grand total here. And then this is my book value that I run specifically for capitalized active sets for the year. And so what am I looking at to balance here? And so uh, first off, um, you know, if I'm looking at kind of the, I'm going to start with the, the uh, schedule change in depreciation. My beginning depreciation, can I balance that against the book value? Yes. Um, and so you got to think my beginning depreciation would be, like I said, the life to date depreciation at the beginning of the year. So, um, but we have to keep a couple things in mind with that is that this de beginning depreciation here is not including any disposed of assets, obviously. Those are tracked here, right? So um, we want to make sure that when we balance this, it's beginning depreciation minus dispositions equals the current life-to-date depreciation on this report. So those you take this minus this, it should reflect the same figure as the life to date here. The um, continuing items, um, acquisitions, dispositions, transfers in and out, that information, um, can I balance that against um, what's you know a, an area on the book value? Yes. So in here, continuing items, minus acquisitions, plus or minus any transfers in and out, which are usually usually a wash, um, is going to equal your year-to-date depreciation. So that's something that can be balanced. Um, your ending depreciation on the summary schedule should balance the total depreciation. And then if I throw in the book value or the schedule of fixed assets by class, because I, I remember that one also contains book value information, which is what book value is all about. Um, I can balance that against the book value as well. So um, the original cost here should be the original cost on my book value. And then my book value figure, which is original cost minus total depreciation should equal the book value figure on my book value report. So, um, so this is kind of like just a good screenshot of all the different ways that these reports can balance to one another. Okay. Now, before you know, I move on to the next part here, which will be brief. I'm just talking about depreciation information. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is just, you know, we talk about, you know, the book value, the schedule change and depreciation. So I just, again, want to just touch upon the depreciation calculations here and just to get you more comfortable with those. And obviously the depreciation information is tracked in the item record. And, um, you know, here are the fields that are affecting that. And like I said, most School districts use the straight line method. Um, so you wouldn't use the factor because that's just for declining balance method. Um, the beginning date is huge. And I'm gonna explain that in an example here in a little bit. Um, in order to calculate depreciation correctly, you have a beginning depreciation date. Um, and most of the time it's the acquisition date. You know, they acquired it, they wanna start depreciating it that day. Um, original cost. Obviously, the life expectancy is huge. It can't depreciate yearly if it doesn't have a useful life figure in there. Um, salvage value. So districts, some districts still use this, and that's fine. It isn't required for gap reporting. Um, but if they want to keep track of that, they can put this in here. And then, obviously, the life-to-date depreciation. We won't get into the 
the different options to calculate life today, but it's just one of those obviously fields that are, you know, are part of the depreciation calculation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's where I kind of want to show a couple examples of like depreciation. And if you're not really comfortable with how is it tracking? How does it calculate? <clears throat> Here are two examples. So for this um, tag, um, <clears throat> excuse me for a minute. Um, the district, excuse me. <clears throat> the district migrated in 2022. And so when I, I look at this item, <clears throat> When I look at this item here, it shows a beginning date of 2019. So this item was added in Classic. They migrated over. And so when they migrated over, it brought over the current life to date figure, you know, as part of the migration. And then you can see that it was also tracking depreciation since then. So my original cost of this item was $85,000 and it was 20 years. So if I divide 85,000 by the 20 years, my, I think my average, uh, my annual, I think I've got this listed here, is about the, uh, yeah, the $4,200. So um, this is just basically telling you as long as you have a depreciation method, a beginning date, a life expectancy and original cost, it'll make that calculation and continue making that calculation, especially in this part where it came over from classic. And so you'll see here that, you know, the life today is currently at 17,144.80. So what I did is I took a snapshot of the book value for just that specific tag as well, just to show you the same. The original cost was $85,000 over 20 years, and it's got the beginning date here, and it's telling me basically what the yearly depreciation is going to be. So if I, you know, so when you think about this, they started it in fiscal year 20. So the beginning date is right 2019. So they have a full year of depreciation for 20, 21, 22, 23. So I've got four full years here. Um, and I'm currently in fiscal year 24. So it's basically telling me that here is that so far I've depreciated 25% of this asset. Here is my current life to date figure, which if I took 4286 times 20 um, or times four years, it, it would amount to about 17,000. Um, and then it's just basically showing me here, these are internal. So when you close, when a district closes um, their calendar year, it records an automatic internal depreciation transaction. So this is where I know that they migrated in fiscal year 22, right? Because I only see depreciation closings for 22 and 23, and they're currently in fiscal year 24. So I think, you know, one thing I just want to keep in mind is that when you're trying to figure out some of this, it's good to create a book value report on it as well, because it kind of shows you, you know, the calculations of what's going on. My year-to-date depreciation is 4286. The book value told me that, and that's what's being reflected in here. And if I added up four years, I would see the life to date here, which is also showing here as well. So I just kind of wanted to show you an example of that as well as an example of a district that um, uh, created a new transaction this year and what happens with that depreciation. So in here, we created an, an asset, the beginning date is 8-25-2023, which is in the current fiscal year of 24, fiscal year 24. And so the life expectancy is um, 10 years. And so right now, obviously, I would not have any life to date depreciation. Uh, the original cost was, was 25.36 here, I forgot to mention that. But I would not have any life to date because I haven't closed the year yet. There is no life to date yet because it was just created this year. So, um, but 
That's why this is empty and that's why this is empty. Once I close fiscal year 24, I will see an internal posting down here um, with whatever the calculated amount will be. So the way that depreciation is tracked in inventory, it's tracked monthly. So based on the beginning depreciation date, another reason why the beginning depreciation date is so important, especially for that first year, it's going to track it by whatever your, your date is here. So they started, this item was the starting beginning depreciation date is in August. So that's not a full year. That's 11 months instead of 12. So what's going to happen then at the end of the year, it's going to not give me $253. I think if I divide that by 10 easily, um, and you know, $253 and 65 cents. That's not going to be my life to date depreciation for fiscal year 24 because it isn't a full year. It's tracking monthly. So it's 11 months out of the year. So again, I know what can help me out, my book value. So if I go in and run a book value for that particular tag, um, it'll show me what my year to date depreciation is basically going to be. So it's not going to be the 250, what I say, 253. It's going to be 232.52. 11 months out of the 12 is what it's going to track based on my beginning depreciation date. So again, just another thing, like just a helpful tip of how that information gets calculated. And again, we have all of this uh, tracked, you know, and documented in the, in the user manual too that kind of explains all of this. Okay, so now that you're all going, what just happened this last hour and a half? I hope that was helpful. Um, you know, just kind of going through what is involved with the gap reporting reports, you know, how those are really all the same, but in different formats, how depreciation is tracked on the gap versus original cost, and how those reports balanced one another. Uh, like I said, you know, we, we do have situations and we do get tickets about, you know, beginning balances and ending balances still not matching. And there's always like a specific reason or case, you know, we are trying any kind of bugs that we have, you know, try to work out, um, you know, and obviously, you know, if there is a change that could bring about, you know, changes in the beginning balance, um, those are things that we would have to to look into, but I think we've got that pretty much on lockdown now that those beginning balance figures will not um, change. Um, what I wanted just to wrap up with are these different links that we have here. Um, and this is just basically the inventory manual. We do have some general procedures. If you have, you know, new people doing inventory in this, you know, when they don't know the steps to create an item, dispose of an item, those are all listed in our general procedures, um, our FAQs, um, and then our release notes, um, uh, our recaps, so links to the inventory recaps, areas of the recaps. And then these are those others that I um, posted on here, that LGS Capital Asset Overview. This is a PowerPoint that they did at OEDSA for us last year, um, very helpful. Uh, the LGS auditors came in and talked about capital assets. So it'd be a good thing to share uh, with your districts. And then that state of Ohio capital asset policy. Um, and so um, that information um, is available as well. And it just goes over like, what are the requ requirements? And it quotes, you know, some of the um, administrative policies um, and puts those numbers in there. So all of that's listed in there. It's just a good piece of information about capital assets. And like I said, I will add a link to that example of um, a school district's um, capital asset policy. I'll link that on here as well, get that out there. Okay, any, any further questions? Okay, hearing none, I think we're good. Hopefully that was helpful. We'll get this recording um, out there and post it to our YouTube channel. And if I look and take a look at what's coming up next, 
under our training. I think we're talking about calendar year end. Can you believe that? I just can't believe it's here already. Um, so next week, we're going to go over USPS calendar year end review. And then on the 8th, we're going to go over USAS. And then we'll do the October release cap in mid-November. We'll talk about um, all of that information. It's probably going to take us until then with all the ESS changes to get the document up. Um, but we're going to go over uh, the release recaps in mid-November that took place in October. So if you guys don't have any other fur further questions, have a great Friday. Enjoy your weekend. And we will see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone.